But uh, for now, if you have a Bible, would you please turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. It would be good to remind anyone who doesn't have a Bible that we have Bibles to give away. We'd love to get a Bible in your hands if you don't own one. Um, it'd be yours to keep. Just uh, let us know that you need that, and we'll meet you out at the Welcome Center uh, to get one in your hands. But uh, follow with me um, as I read from Genesis chapter 16. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's verses 1 through 16, um, so stay with me. Uh, it'll be on the screen here as well if you don't have a Bible so that you can follow um, as we read. This is God's Word. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said, and so after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress, and then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar, and so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Ro'oi. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. And so Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to his son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Let's pause as we do. We're going to ask God to help us to understand his word. Lord, that is our prayer, that you would help us. Um, feed us from your word. Give us a truth that goes beyond information. We always want to guard against that, God. We don't come just to know more information. We come to know you, we pray. But only you can make that happen, and that's why we call out to you now. As we've read your words, and they're still in our minds and still in our hearts, we pray that you work in them, through them, to us. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have to start off on kind of a, a side point here, so bear with me if you can, but um, uh, that song we sang right before we, we get into the message here is perfect, and we were asking God to speak to us, to feed us. I just want you to know we pray early on Sunday morning, um, pastors and, and uh, our uh, other folks who help out here, we, we pray specifically for God speak in this moment. Because I know that what Jesus said, we live by more than bread alone. We live, every one of us, by the word of God. As God speaks to us, we can't survive. You can survive physically, 
but spiritually you cannot survive without hearing God speak. And so we pray, I pray, God, in this time of sermon, uh, feed your people. You're hungry. I see you come in and I know you're spiritually hungry. God, feed us. I'm also well aware that um, if you ate one meal a week, physically, you'd be starving. Uh, you'd really struggle. I also know that if you count on just the sermon time on Sunday morning to feed on God's word, you're going to starve spiritually. And so my prayer is all, always, God, teach us from your word. Tell us what it means. Show us what you're, what you're saying, but also show us how to read your word. Um, it's sort of that old phrase. Most of you know it. You know, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, He'll sit in his boat all day and drink beer. That's the, the idea behind it. Maybe that's not how it goes. I can't remember. No, if you, if you hear from God's word and you feed on it, great. But if you don't know how to read God's word regularly, you're going to starve. And so God teaches us how to do that. I, I mention that because this text is maybe a prime example for us to learn how to read and how not to read especially what we call narratives in the Bible. Narratives are what this whole series is really about. Narratives are stories. They're true stories of people who've had encounters with God, and in His Word, He tells us all about this. But what I hear from a lot of folks, and, and some of this is just legitimate as they're wrestling with trying to come to know who God is, and they're wrestling with the truth. They question the Bible because they say, this is exactly why, Cliff, it's really hard for me to believe. Because here, they say, is a classic text that shows that the Bible is filled with all kinds of stuff that we just don't follow. And you say, well, what do you mean? What, what's here? Well, a lot of folks would say, in this text alone, you have polygamy and you have slavery. And the Bible is telling us that it's okay and here's where we have to be very careful and say, the Bible is not saying that polygamy and slavery are okay. And you're like, well, it was right here, Abram and Sarah. Those are the heroes that we're studying, isn't it? This is the series on Abraham and Sarah, and we're trying to look at their life so that we have examples of how we should live. Ah, that's the key, isn't it? We come to the Bible wrongly if we look at it as a book of virtues, a book of heroes, hero stories, faith heroes, if I can just be like Abraham, if I can just be like Sarai, if I can just be like these heroes of faith, I guess that's what God is trying to tell me from his word. And we misread the Bible when we do that, primarily because of this. The Bible is not primarily a book of virtues to tell us, here's a good example, go follow this. The Bible, and this is the way Tim Keller puts it, I love this, he said the Bible is first and foremost, don't get me wrong, there are examples and commandments and things to follow, but it comes second. First and foremost, the Bible, he says, is a record of God's intervening grace. How God comes to a world like us who is messed up, broken, sinners, and God intervenes with grace. He says it's a record of the good news of God's intervening grace into the lives of people who don't have virtue, who are not good examples, who don't live out good morals, who don't deserve God's love, who don't seek God's love, who continually resist God's love, and who don't even appreciate God's love after we are saved by God's love. That's what First and foremost, the Bible is not about, let me find this good example in Abraham and Sarah and then try to live it. You will fail. That is religion. That is trying to find a way in which we can justify ourselves by being good enough morally. Instead, the Bible is so good about this. Name any human hero in the Bible and the Bible will give you the raw, uncut edition of their lives. It is constantly giving us someone that we say, wow, that's someone to look up to, and then giving us a chapter like this where Abraham and Sarah blow it, where they mess up, where they are doing things, and you say, well, but it doesn't say, and God said this was bad. It doesn't say, narratives don't do that. But here's what narratives do. If you read all of the narratives, read the book of Genesis, by the end of the book of Genesis, 
you will get the lesson, if you're looking for the lesson that God gives us, polygamy is not according to his will. How do you know that? Because God will show that even though his people engaged in it, it was always a disaster. Always. If you're looking for the message that the scriptures teach on that, it is that it doesn't work. It's not God's design. Of course, if you read the beginning of Genesis, you see God's design. Male and female, he made them for one one for another, for a marriage that's going to last, that they become one flesh. God had no plans to do these other, and yet here are God's people doing the very things that God doesn't really want. And we would expect, if this was a book about doing the right thing, that God would check out and say, I can't work with people who are into slavery and polygamy. And yet, God's not finished with them yet. So I mention this because I know this is a, a struggle for a lot of folks. It seems to be advocating these things. It's not. Read the rest of the narratives and you will see that Abram and Sarai have just created a world of hurt for themselves. A complicated mess. And over and over again, God will try to point them to it and say, see, that is not my way. But narratives do it in, I would call it, the long way of teaching and not the immediate way of, hey, this is wrong, don't do this. So the first thing that we have to look for in every Bible text is not the example, but we look for the intervening grace of God. We look for God. Where do we find God in this text? Where do we find the good news? Well, can I just say that as we're beginning to look for God in this part of the story of Abram, Sarai, and now we get this other character brought in, this slave woman named Hagar, that we find, when we look for God, we find God in the middle of a lot of suffering and pain. If you're wondering, I'm seeking God, and you might think maybe I find God in a pristine, all sanitized place of my life, you know where you're going to find God as we look at this, you find God is in the very middle of the mess. He's in the middle of the suffering and the pain. Look at verse 2. Sarai said to Abram, the Lord, that's Yahweh, has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. There's a lot of suffering here, and it, we can start with Sarai. What kind of suffering is she going through? Well, the first suffering that she experiences begins early in her life. She's not able to have children. We said that she, God called her and Abram out of a place in what is now sent, uh, south, southern Iraq, and in that place of Ur, it was a center of moon worship of a moon god named Nana, who was known as a fertility god, and she grew up in an oppressive culture that said, if you're a woman and you can't have children, you are nothing. You don't have value. You don't have significance. Your life is worthless unless you can have children. Now, that was common throughout the ancient Near East. In biblical times, that was so important to them. And now imagine if you're in the center of that and you are Sarai and you are wanting badly to have kids and you can't for whatever reason. Eventually, Sarai will even say, I think this is God stopping me from having kids. It's the Lord who's preventing this from happening. She's hurting. She is suffering. She's suffering shame. And she longs to know that she really does matter in this world. So much so that, you know, even in this time, she had suffered so much shame because it was even a law in the ancient Near East. If you had a wife who could not provide children for you, it was grounds for a husband to divorce her and put her away because everything depended on having children and prolonging through a family and having a legacy. Sarai is suffering terribly under this kind of shame. Abram's also suffering. He, of course, wants kids as well. He wants a legacy beyond himself. God has given this incredible promise, come out of that place and I will make a great nation out of you. But that was, according to this passage, as we looked in here in, in uh, Genesis 16, 10 years ago. 10 years. And God still hasn't done anything along the children front. Sarai was 65 when we first got here. Now she's 75. Abram's 85 years old. You know, they might have thought, you know, if if Sarai could get pregnant right away when we got to the promised land, 
you know, probably we're going to end up in the National Enquirer, you know, 65-year-old woman gives birth, and that would be really something. But now, at age 75, even the National Enquirer is going to laugh and say, that's too crazy. That's nuts. We can't, we can't possibly put something like that out there. They both think that this is now almost beyond the scope of miracle. And they're hurting, and Abram is hurting, wanting a child and wanting a family, a legacy. He's also hurting for this reason. Guys, isn't this true? We're kind of, a lot of guys, we're fixers. Somebody comes to us with a problem. Let me tell you what's going on. Yeah, let, uh, let me come up with a plan to fix that. He can't fix this. Uh, see, Abram has seen his wife suffer, and it's, uh, he loves Sarai. He loves her. He has not put her away. He loves his wife, and he he's longs to fix this, and this is the one thing he cannot fix. He's suffering. But also Hagar is suffering. Now, she's suffering in a kind of a different way. She's a slave. She's not even seen as a person. She's seen as property. Here's someone who doesn't get to ask, Can I, do I want to do this? You just do it when you're told as a slave. Even something like, hey, you're going to sleep with the master of the household, and you are going to be a surrogate mother, and that child will not be yours. It will belong to the master and the mistress of the household Hagar, you don't have a choice in this deal. This is exactly what's going to happen. She's suffering. As a slave, she's already suffering because she too wants to know that she matters. I have significance in this world. I'm a slave. I'm property. Where did she come from? She says she's an Egyptian slave. If you remember back in Genesis 12, how did Abram and Sarai end up with an Egyptian slave? Well, they hightailed it down to Egypt during that famine. They weren't sure if God was going to provide and Pharaoh gives them all kinds of gifts, including, it says, male and female slaves, servants, including, we're going to guess here, this Egyptian slave, as she comes from Egypt, Hagar. She is pushed around, told where to go. She doesn't have a sense that she matters. She's suffering. And now she's caught in this little play out where she doesn't have any say whatsoever. Here's the one thing. We're going to find God in the middle of all this suffering. Something that suffering does, while we're looking for God, where is God, what's he going to do, that we can notice about our own suffering. And I'm well aware, because it hits my heart every time that you gather as a church. We gather together, and I know coming through those doors, there are some of you who are really suffering. You know by experience what we're talking about here, where you feel like you don't have control where people are running over your life and you're getting pushed and shoved and the circumstances are overwhelming you and you are suffering. Here's the first thing that I, I think we can begin to see from this text is that we notice in the suffering what matters most. Your suffering and my suffering will bring to the surface the stuff that we believe is the most important in our life. Suffering has this unique ability to focus us on what we think is most important important. We already noted what it is for Sarai and Abram and Hagar. For us, what is it that's most important in your life when you begin to suffer? It was interesting to me, I was reading this story about our 911 system. You know, you're in trouble, you got an emergency, dial 911. And you think, well, people dial that when there's an absolute emergency. They need help now because the most important thing in life is in jeopardy. It comes to the surface. Usually we say it would be a life is in jeopardy, right? But then I found out from this story that, especially in metropolitan areas, 70% sometimes of the 911 calls that are made are not necessarily about what we would consider the most important thing in life. Maybe for some of you, I don't know, but I, I was reading this and they said somebody had called 911, actually several people did, called 911 in an emergency because they were watching the series finale of Breaking Bad and the cable went out. And so they called 911 because this was a hightail emergency. My cable's gone. I don't know what's going to happen. And so they called 911. Some people have called 911 when Facebook has gone out for a few hours and they weren't able to post. One woman called 911 when she had just had the police there for a domestic disturbance. I don't know the whole story behind that, but they'd come out. Domestic disturbance, the police were there, they left. She called 911 because she said the police were just here and there was one of the police officers who was here was really cute. And I didn't get his name or number. Could you send him back? 
And they did. They sent him back, and he arrested her for misusing 911 is what <laughs> happened out of all that. One guy called 911 because he didn't get cheese on his hamburger from a fast food place. One person called 911 because, quote, my son won't give me the remote control. And then lastly, one person called 911 to say, can an officer come over and tell my kids to please go to bed? That might be a real emergency, so I can understand that one. Here's the thing. In each one of those cases, you're like, they are misusing the system. Why? Because what they consider in that moment of suffering to be most important, most people would say, that is not most important. You are misusing the people who are meant to provide what is most important, EMT responders and firemen and police to come and save lives. See, now this is where it gets tricky for us. And don't get me wrong, we get in trouble. 911 spiritually, we start calling out to God, don't we? Mm, man, God, everything that's most important to me is at risk. And it comes to the surface in our suffering. Now, don't misunderstand me. Don't ever, ever, ever hesitate to call on God in an emergency. Don't ever hesitate to do that. But at the same time, notice what exactly that we're asking God to do when we make the call. Notice what we're asking Him. A lot of times where it gets tricky is that we say to God, God, I am about to lose some wealth and I need your help. God, I'm about to lose some health, and I need your help. God, I'm about to lose some of my uh, sense of, of value in the community, or I'm about to lose this in my life, and, I, and those things are all important. But at some point, we have to ask ourselves, am I actually just using God to get a greater treasure than God himself? See, that's the tricky part for us because I don't believe there's any one of us, me included, who could say that our hearts are always full with the sense of, God, what I really want is you, not what you can give me. There's always a part of our heart, maybe a little part, maybe a big part, that says, maybe if I, if I try to do what God wants, if I pray the right way, if, if I come to worship regularly, if I read my Bible, Pastor Cliff says I've got to read it more than once a week, I, I'm going to start reading my Bible regularly. If I do that, maybe God will be pleased or happy or approve me enough that he'll give me then what I'm really asking for, which is not really God, but what God can provide. All those things are good. We make those requests known to God, but we've got to start discerning, in my suffering, am I trying to say to God, I don't really want you I really just want what you can give me because God says this plainly to us in the gospel. I have come to give you life and that life is me, Jesus says. In other words, Jesus says, I have not come to be a means to an end. I am the end. I am what you were made for. The thing that you long for that you think can be found in something else, it's a lie. You can only find it in me. I have not come to be a means to an end of what you want. I am what you've always wanted, and I can give you nothing else except ultimately me. And so Jesus then begins to say some really hard stuff. So pick up your cross and follow me. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Why, why would I want to take, take up a sign of crucifixion and a sign of suffering and because Jesus said, because even if you suffer, you will have the most important treasure, which is me. And so we have to start discerning. Abram and Sarah have to go through this too. See, they have to determine, is desiring my family, having a child, do I desire that more than God? God's going to test them on this later too. Do I want that? God can give it to me, so God, I'll do whatever you want as long as you give me that treasure Suffering has this strange way of bringing to the surface, and then when God doesn't, this is what Sarai says. She says, I think God has not followed the deal. We moved. We're, we're, follow, we're doing what he wants. Now the deal is he's supposed to give us kids, and God's not holding up his end of the bargain. She's wrestling with this, but it's come to the surface. But here's the thing, and you and I can note this. I can know that I'm trying to use God instead of love God, when God won't give it to me and I start using you. If I start in my relationships starting to use people, I can be sure I'm frustrated that God won't give me what I want. 
And this is what happens here. Sarai is going to use Hagar, really use her and abuse her. And after she has a child, Sarai's going to mistreat her. She's a pregnant woman. I mean, you're thinking, well, what does that mean, mistreat? All I can think of is if you're a slave in that time and place, she is actually probably beating a pregnant woman. This is a slave. Hey, you're supposed to give me what I want. And she's trying to use a relationship, another person, to get what she wants. Abram is actually going to use Hagar too. The reason, by the way, we all chuckle when it's like, Sarai says, Abram, this is your fault. Every guy goes, see? See, that's the problem right there. It wasn't his idea. This was Sarai's idea. Why? You know what she's really saying is not that it, was your, my, it wasn't my idea. She's saying, look, Hagar is starting to look down at me. She's not acting like a slave anymore because she's pregnant with your child, Abram, and you are treating her well. And you're not supposed to do that with a slave. So, Abram, this is your fault that she's looking down at me. And what does Abram do? Does he stand with integrity here and goes, look, Sarah, it is wrong to use people that way, and we're going to treat her well. No, Abram says, she's your servant. Go ahead, I'm just going to wash my hands of this. And Abram is going to use Hagar to try to keep his marriage happy. He's going to use that woman. By the way, Hagar even gets drawn into this. She's this pawn that's got pushed around, but she's actually going to try to use the baby, and she's going to try to use Abram to gain a sense of self-importance and worth and significance where she can look down and treat her mistress by despising her. Everybody starts using everybody when we can't get it from God. God's trying to reveal this because he wants to heal them of this. He wants to fix them of this problem, the sin problem that we all have. And so God works to change us over time. Look what it says in verses 3 and 4. This strikes me. How much time is going on? So Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years. Spoiler alert here. They come into the land. Abram's 75, Sarah's 65. They're not going to have a child, not for 10 years more, for 25 years before they have a child. This is the promise God gave man, there's a gap between, you ever feel this on Sunday morning? Cliff's preaching about a promise of God, and there's this huge gap in my life between the promise and the reality of it. They can relate, and they can even put a timetable to it. They say, shoot, 10 years. We've been spinning our wheels for 10 years, but this is the first thing to note, right? We're looking for God first here. Can I just say this? The time, we always think it's wasted time. Some people are like, yeah, I'm burning time right now. I got a half hour that I can't get back after this sermon, right? I'm wasting time, or you're sitting somewhere. You, you're, it's wasted time when we just wait. God has never wasted one second of your life. Not one moment of your life has God wasted. He calls you and I to wait sometimes, but that is not wasted time. Why? Because God is doing something there. There's one way to think about prayer. Maybe some of you have heard this. There are four possible answers to prayer that you get from the scriptures. If you and I ask God for something, there's one way you can get the answer is no. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the straightforward one. That's when you and I ask for something that's not according to God's will. It's not according to his plan. It's when some guy goes, hey, this looks like a plan right here. You know, we get a slave. We start, you know, can we do that, God? And God's answer is going to be no. That's not according to my will. Sometimes we ask for things that aren't right. There are other answers, though. Instead of no, the answer is sometimes slow. It's either no, slow, grow, or go. The second answer of slow means this. You've asked for the right thing. It's in God's will, but the timing's not right. And God says, I'm doing other things, and the timing's not right. I'm giving you the answer, yes, but not yet. Then there's a third answer, and this is the one that applies here, which is, not no, not slow, but grow, which is God says, hey, the thing you asked for is right. It's according to my will. The timing is right, but guess what? You're not right. What do you mean I'm not right, God? I have to change you for you to even receive what I'm going to give you. You have to be changed in order for me to give this to you. Isn't this exactly why they do, why do they put, you know, you got to be a certain age to drive you know, what, what is it? I know on the farm it's like four years old. You can drive when you're four. 
But normally, if it's 16 or whatever, right? I told my girls, you have to be 40 before you can start driving. That's the law, that's the rule. Why do I have to wait so long? Well, it's pretty simple. On a physical level, they say, my goodness, you're going to be in charge of a 2,000-pound vehicle that can travel up to 100 miles an hour. You can do tremendous damage. It's a big responsibility. If you can't even physically control it, you can't be able to drive. So you have to reach a certain physical age where you can control the thing, but also, they say, a certain mental and emotional age so you understand the responsibility. That's for a driver's license. How much more when God says, I want to give you an answer to a prayer that is eternal in value. It is priceless in inheritance. Well, give it to me. I'm ready. God says, no, not yet. You're not quite ready. See, Abram and Sarah, God says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You are going to be the foundation of a whole group of people that will come from you, a family line that will come from you that will bless all nations. Fantastic. Let's get started. And God says, Abram and Sarah, you aren't ready to be that foundation yet. You're using people. You're abusing people. When as soon as you have to wait a little bit, you can't wait any longer and you start rushing ahead, God says, give me a little more time to change you. And here's the thing, God changes us when he says, hey, I want you to grow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause you to wait. And if you're in a waiting period right now, don't believe the lie that the devil th will throw at you to say, I'm just wasting my time by waiting. You are not. God is actually using that to change you and he's making you ready for the answer that is to come. But we have to go through that process of being changed over time. Lastly, this. God may not, this is the hard word for me, God may not change our circumstances, but God is with us in every circumstance. Notice here the, the different things that the, the angel of the Lord says to Hagar. Hagar is suffering she, she wants a, a basically relief, and all she can know to do is to run away. So she runs, she hightails it, a pregnant woman, a slave who's pregnant, on the run, in the desert. She's trying to head back down to Egypt. She doesn't get very far, but she's on this desert road, and she comes by a spring in the desert, which is a great picture for the way God meets us in our suffering. Your life feels like you're in the middle of a desert wasteland. Well, what good can come there? Well, there's a spring and that's where God meets us. He comes to us like cold water for lips that are just parched. And what does he say? A number of things. But the first thing he said is the hardest thing. Hagar, I'm here. Fantastic. Who are you? I'm the Lord. Okay. What's the first thing that, that he says to her? Go back. Go back? Why would I go back to the worst circumstances of my life? Why would you want me to do that? He doesn't get into the details of the why. We just know that he says, first and foremost, I am going to be with you when you go back. So many times you and I will pray, our lives are a mess, or this problem is, is looming, and we say, God, change this circumstance in my life, please. Change the circumstance, and God says, I'm not going to change the circumstance. And our hearts will be tempted to say, well, then what good are you? What good are you if you're not going to change my circumstance? Remember, I'm going to change you. Okay, you're going to change me, but the circumstances are still awful, and I will be with you. And that will be more than enough. How is that going to be more than enough? Go back to your mistress. I will increase your descendants. You're going to make it through. I know you don't think you're going to make it through, Hagar. You don't think you're going to survive? You will. I will make sure you will. And I promise you that out of that, you will have many, many descendants, more than you can count. And other than, otherwise, I also want to know this, Hagar. I have seen your misery. The Lord has seen your misery. He has heard your cry. There's never a moment of suffering that you and I have ever gone through that God has somehow missed. He really has not been on vacation. He really has not just turned his back for a moment while you are suffering in your circumstances. Well, then God changed the circumstances and God says, I'm not gonna, always. Sometimes he does. But more and more as I read scripture, God says, go back. Go back into the mess. But go back differently 
because I will be with you, and that will be more than enough. So he may not change your circumstances, but he wants to change you, and he doesn't primarily change our circumstances to make our life circumstances better. He works to make you and I better. And he says that will be the most important thing. Why will that be so important? Because he says, imagine this. Imagine if I change you through this suffering in such a way that you have your greatest love founded in me, that you have a great trust in me, such that no matter what circumstance you face, you will be able to get through it. You will thrive even under those circumstances. Can I just close with reading this? I'll just tell you, it was written by a guy who wrote it from prison. I'll tell you that this guy, if you think you've suffered, he suffered. This guy literally was tried, he, he was attempted, people tried to kill him multiple times. This is a man who understood rejection, people who tossed him out on his ear every place that he seemed to go, people who misunderstood him, who criticized him, who undercut him, and in every way abandoned him many, in, in many cases. And he wrote this from prison. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, what if God said, I know what your circumstances are so bad right now and it's painful, but what if I could make changes in you so that you could say that? That you could say, no matter what the circumstances, I have found a contentment that runs deeper than my circumstances, a peace that is not dependent on whether my day goes well today or not, a joy that is not dependent on things always falling my way, but instead that I have found this greatest treasure that a God who stays with people who are suffering, who sees my pain, who cares, and says, I'm going to make you into such a person that whatever your circumstances are, you can say, I'm at peace. I'm content. Let it come what may. You cannot shake a life that is founded on that love. That's the love that we proclaim. That's the God that we proclaim today. Even for people who mess up like Abram and Sarai, he says, I'm going to make you like that. Do you believe that? Let's pray.